welcome you to Bethel Ridge Church today and for those of you who are going to be with us online to this great celebration of Resurrection Day. On Friday night we finish with Jesus' great last words from the cross when he said, it is finished. Three days later on resurrection morning, his father said, Amen. In saying that, he established hope on earth in human history. And so we celebrate today. The announcements are on the wall. I don't know that I have to add any to that um, except one um, today is the we for three Sundays now I just saw people kind of leaving on the way out we've been receiving an offering for uh, pregnancy options and um, we're just part of a whole community of churches that are kind of making up for the great difference that um, th that they have had to, to make up in the last year. And it, there's a matching fund that's going to help do it, but it looks like not, we're going to make it. And we praise the Lord for that. The Apostle Paul said that in Christ, all those who are in Christ by faith have been raised with him. And so it's most appropriate that together we confess our great faith and our praise to him in this Psalm of David. 
together. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Father, we worship our risen Lord and Savior, Your spirit is present in this place. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, join our celebration. For Jesus' sake, amen. Three wonderful hymns of Easter Resurrection praise. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia, alleluia, and because he lives. Let's stand as we sing. <laughs>
has some really good words for us. First Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of the first importance that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Because he is son is alive, and because he has gained our access to his father, we have the authority to come into his presence and pray and know that he is listening. Let's begin our prayer as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Father, every Sunday and during the week as well, we come to you with our praise and we come with our requests. Pray for things surrounding Bethel Ridge, our church. We pray for those things that surround the church that is so persecuted in, your, in this world. We pray for the mission that you have given our church. We pray for our country. Oh, Father, we pray for people. We pray for each other. Father, we do this because you have promised. You have promised that you would listen to our prayer. that you would supply our needs, that you have given us your spirit to guide us in faith in Jesus Christ as we follow him through the circumstances of life. You have told us that we are to cast our cares on you because you care for us. You've told his father that our sins are forgiven. You've told us that nothing can possibly happen in our lives 
that will frustrate your good purposes for us. You have told us that nothing can possibly happen that separates us from your love. You have told us that you are preparing a place for us and you are preparing us for that place. Father, we have gathered as well to, as we're speaking to you, we are here to listen to the words that you would speak through our brother Steve. Father, they're words that we long to hear today. We thank you that we can pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If the kids can come over in the front row, I'm sure. Thank you. I get a picture for you. Who do you think that is? I'll tell you. It's my dad. If I were to tell you all of the good things that my dad gave us, oh, I'd be here a long time. But he left us for heaven. So we have a lot of happy memories. I have some pictures. Got another picture for you. Who do you think that is? It's Jesus. Yes. Now, if I were to start telling you all the great things that he did for us. But you know, one of his friends, John, he's the one who wrote the Gospel of John. He said, looking back over Jesus' life, that if all those great things were written down and put in a book, that book would be too big for the world to hold. What do you think was the greatest thing that Jesus did? Well, what's he carrying? A cross. He died to take away our sins on that cross. Well, you don't get much greater than that. But then, think a little bit. We have lots of happy memories about Jesus, and we draw pictures. Is that all that we have of him? Just memories? Ah, he died. Three days later, what happened? Yes, he rose. He rose. Empty tomb. We don't say Jesus was, we say Jesus is. You know? alive. The day he died, his friends, the disciples, all those people, they were terribly sad. They didn't know that he died to take their sins away. They didn't know he was going to rise again. All they knew was no Jesus. And that was terribly sad. But three days, Sunday morning, Easter morning, he rose again. But you know what? He didn't stay with them very long. A few weeks, and he left them for heaven. Well, we'll see in a moment, that was good news. I said to my dad, he left us for heaven. What he may be doing up in heaven? I don't know. I know I can't talk to him. Jesus left us for heaven. And you know, it says, he left us, he went up to heaven in order that he could fill the whole world, the whole universe. And that is good news. Why? Well, think, Jesus in his body on earth, could he fit into your heart? Mm, not really. But now he can live in your heart and yours and yours and yours. What's he doing? Now, my dad, what's he doing up in heaven? I don't know. 
What is Jesus doing? We know that because the Bible tells us what Jesus is doing. One thing. He was just about to leave his friends for heaven. And he said, don't be sad. I am going there to make a place for you in heaven so that you can be with me forever. I said, I couldn't talk to my dad. You can talk to Jesus every moment of every day. And he talks to you in his word, the Bible. Not only that, it says that he is talking to God the Father about you. He's praying for you so that when you're sin, you'll be forgiven. So that you won't fall. Praying for you when you're sad, when you're hurt, all those things. And one more thing, he said that he is coming back someday to take you and you and you and you to be with him in heaven forever. Now, Lynn and Kay have something special for you, and afterwards we're going to sing a special song about what Jesus is doing now. Good morning to all, and happy Easter. And um, this morning, we have a little presentation, and it's about the jelly bean prayer. And after I read the jelly bean prayer, Kay has some little bags to pass out to all the kids. Um, this is a jelly bean prayer, and it goes like this. The red is for the blood he gave, the green is for the grass he made. The yellow is part, it, the yellow is for the sun so bright, the orange is for the edge of night, the black is for the sins we made, the white is for the grace he gave, the purple is for the hour of sorrow, the pink is for a new tomorrow. A bag of jelly beans, colorful and sweet, is a prayer, a promise, and an Easter treat. So you can take this home. This little note is inside that bag. And if you have some friends, you could share that poem with your friends or whatever. So enjoy your little jelly beans. <laughs> well, thank you, and let's stand and sing. I have one more thing. Oh, so I'm sorry. I was just asked um, if I would give just a short testimony about what happened to Kay and I on Tuesday of this, of this past week. We were on our way to Abbott for an appointment for Kay, and um, we had just gotten done with all the rain that had washed away all the snow, and it was pretty good when we left here. And when we got about 10 miles out of town on 35W, it was snowing and blowing so much we couldn't see in front of the car. It was all icy underneath, and um, it was just the, everything was gray around us. And um, we had to drive 25 miles all the way to Abbott. And on our way up there, we saw semis in the ditch. There were two cars in the ditch. It was really, really, really a rough time. But we made it to Abbott, and when we got done at Abbott, we left about 12.30 on our way home. It was twice as bad. And to make a long story short, Kay and I are so grateful and so thankful to be here. We thought we were, we were going home. Mm -hmm. um, it was really, really, really rough. We were driving about 20, 15 to 20 miles an hour on our way home. And two cars, the car in front of us and then in front of her was a car that the lady started to fishtail, and Kay, Kay seen that. And she said, oh no. And this lady was fishtailing and ended up on the opposite side of the road this way. And we were going this way. The car in front of us stopped, we stopped, and she was just stuck there fishtailing. Um, all of a sudden, a, a truck, a, a truck, just a pickup truck, 
came whizzing by and went over and took the left-hand lane. We thought he was going to end up in the, in the median, in the ditch, but he didn't. He made it. But behind him were two 20-ton semis that were coming about 60 and 70 that could never have stopped if they tried. And so Kay said, where are they going to go? And I said, they won't fit between her and, <laughs> and the ditch. And the first semi came and passed by so fast, it just made the cars almost spin. The second truck came, the semi truck, right behind him. And when he was almost past, his back started fishtailing, and he hit that lady in, that was in the median, or the, that was on that side of the road, and it smashed her back end in. That's all it did. We thought he was going to just run into all of us, knock us in the ditch, turn us over, roll over on us. We were just, I think Kay was almost ready for a heart attack, and I think I was in shock. Otherwise, I would have been crying and everything, but we are just so thankful to be here. We thought we were going to end up in the ditch on, underneath a semi-truck. No one got hurt in that accident. The lady that was it stuck in the middle of the road, started her car up and went in front of us and we followed her about five miles. She was a little Somali lady and I think she, I don't know how she felt, but it was very a tragic thing that we thought we were gonna happen and it didn't and we're so thankful to be here. I just wanted to share that with everybody. It wasn't our time yet, so, <laughs> but we thought it was, but it wasn't. It's all in God's time. Yeah, thankful to the Lord. It is true because he lives. We can face tomorrow. That's right. Even <laughs> the ditch, even <laughs> especially in heaven. Let's stand and sing to our risen Lord. <laughs> Telling the Easter story today from Mark's Gospel, you know, it's a fascinating but kind of baffling thing to take the four Easter accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and compare. That can be confusing. I mean, they all tell the story, but they're not the same at all. But think of it this way. You want to find out about a mountain. So you, spend, you send four people up that mountain and ask them to take a journal of it, or write down their observations, what they saw. Afterwards, compare. Mm, it would have been a lot easier to figure things out if you only had one, or if they all copied off the same thing. But you wouldn't have learned anywhere near as much about the mountain. Well. Four different sets of eyes, four different, different eyewitness accounts, and in fact, envisioning four different audiences. Um, today we get the good news of Easter from Mark. Mark 16. 
When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which is very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus and Nazarene, who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, two Marys and Salome brought burial spices. Looked like they were a delegation from the larger company of women who had been with Jesus in his last hours on the cross. They lingered at the cross till Jesus' body was taken down. They followed to the burial site. Joseph of Arimathea took the body, prepared it for burial in his own tomb. But the day was getting on, and the Jews didn't violate the Sabbath even to prepare a body. So, necessarily, the deed was done in haste. As women will, they watched and resolved to come back after the Sabbath, to come back and do it right. What we would have called Saturday evening, after the sun ended the Sabbath, they bought spices for embalming with the intention of getting there at first light in the morning to do what time and um, increasing heat would only make more unpleasant. So, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb? Oops. In fact, no small consideration. The stone would have been heavy indeed. They weren't meant for removal. And of a rich man's tomb, all the more so. Um, but whatever they'd been thinking or they just weren't thinking, turned out not to matter. The obstacle was no more. When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which is very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of the Nazarene who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you, and there in four short verses is arguably the greatest event of all history. Of it, Paul said, that would spread life the way Adam's sin spread death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As such, you might have expected that young man in white robe to dwell at least a little bit longer on that remarkable fact Jesus is alive. Um, and you wonder, what does Galilee have, to do, Galilee have to do with anything that it should figure so prominently? The fact is the angel isn't giving news so much as marching orders. Or better, he's giving news for the sake of marching orders. See, not here, no. Go, tell his disciples. Urgency. Not least because a lot to be done, little time to do it. And more than that, there was desperate need to get the disciples back on track. Because when you think of it, they were pretty much what Jesus had to show for three years of ministry. He didn't write anything. He didn't build anything. He spent his time pre teaching and preparing these twelve. And now they're in disarray. So, what's this about Galilee? Well, it was in Galilee where they became a band, a unit. 
on a mountain, read about it in chapter 13, spent a whole night in prayer, and then out of the loose assemblage of followers, more or less committed to him, he chose 12, the apostles. And they became an organism, a body. They had a number. I mean, there, were, there weren't 10 this day and 14 the next, depending on who showed up. They were the 12. They had division of labor. They had a spokesman. And most important, they had a mission. But that mission was abandoned when, at Jesus' arrest in the garden, they all ran off. Turn back a page to chapter 14. The last thing they did as a group, everyone deserted him and fled. So much for the 12. So, first priority, restoration in Galilee. Go, the angel said, tell his disciples and Peter, which is curious phrasing. I mean, Peter was a disciple, or maybe is, was. What about Peter? It's a put down that you possibly heard. I've heard it said of Texas. The whole inhabitable world and Texas. Um, disrespect intended. Um, hard to know just what to read between the lines there, but the one thing spelled out in black and white, Peter is included. Peter, go meet Jesus in Galilee. In other words, he still wanted. Jesus hadn't given up on him. Which may have come as very much a surprise to Peter. Because Jesus had told them, reading back in chapter 8, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. It wasn't a little thing to deny Jesus. Remember the story in the high priest's courtyard? It asked Peter about his association with Jesus. He swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. And he could very well have figured that as far as Jesus was concerned, his goose was cooked. But Jesus was raised from the dead. And with a living savior, there's hope of a second chance, forgiveness, new beginnings. Paul told the Corinthians, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Only Christ has been raised. And the Hebrews author says, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He lives in order to intercede. He intercedes in order to save, to rescue, to restore. Peter sinned, but Jesus lives, and he speaks to the Father in our defense. We sin, and our living Savior speaks to the Father for us. And if he didn't dump Peter, he won't dump you and me. Good news for those of us who mess up. Come June, I'm reclaiming my VW bike. I'm bringing it here. It got re rear-ended once and got a salvage registration. And to fix it up, I was asked, now, do you want to restore this, you know, original parts, all that? Uh, no, I, I just want the thing to work. Um, Restoration wasn't the issue. Jesus restores in order to recommission. He repairs in order to get us to work. Paul says we're created in Christ Jesus to do good work. Hence the bit about Galilee. There, Jesus would tell his disciples, go into all the world and make everybody my disciples. Remember the story from the Old Testament, God said to Abraham, I'm kind of similar, through you, I'm going to bless everybody out to the ends of the earth. Jesus is repeating in Galilee that commission. Go do it. 
Go carry God's blessing to the ends of the earth. But between the resurrection of Jesus and the recommissioning in Galilee, recommissioning of that team to evangelize the world, there was a fragile, vital link. A group of very frightened women. The angel told them, go, tell his disciples. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that might sound like a very strange place to stop reading, but to appearances, that is where Mark stopped writing. What remains is scripture, but it's very unlike Mark's style and really doesn't end the story. Um, it's just a summary of post-Easter events. Read on in the parallel accounts and you find how the women met Jesus, searched out the disciples, told them. But our text interrupts it at a crucial moment, the moment of decision. They have big news, bigger than which you couldn't imagine. Jesus is alive. His promises are true. Granted, they hadn't seen him face to face, but they had reliable evidence. The ancient made a point of showing it to them. Now, look at the tomb. Now, go. They have news, and they have a commission. Go, kill. And if that sounds familiar, we have the same news, and we have a commission. And it hasn't gotten any less important. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Then he asks, how can they believe if they don't hear? And how can they hear unless someone tells them? Now, someone knew all that and had been told, go tell. What could keep him from telling? Well, Mark says they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. What did they have to be afraid of? Well, certainly seeing an angel would frighten anybody, but that, but that was over and done with, and now it's an exciting story. Um, what fear could silence them? Keep them from blurting out what was the best news ever? Well, one thing, the news may have been very good, it was not very believable. And they certainly ran the risk, being scorned, to laughed at. And if that was their fear, it was justified. Read in Luke's account, when the women finally told the disciples, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. And these were the disciples. And nonsense. Don't believe you. Maybe the more unbelievable, because there was so much about what they had seen and heard that they couldn't begin to understand. They couldn't uh, begin to explain. They make proper fools of themselves, maybe in the disciples' eyes, that is precisely what they look like. But you'd have to add, God is willing to take that risk when he sends us with his message. When he sent his disciples out preaching, he didn't let them think for a moment that everyone was going to believe. But some would, and they would be saved. Paul says, we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Yeah, we might look silly, but we're sent out anyway. He experienced that himself in Athens, speaking to the philosophers. At his mention of the resurrection, <laughs> resurrection, the dead rising, that's ridiculous. They laughed. Most did. A few believed. The others rejected his foolishness, the best news ever. What other fear could have silenced them? Well, consider Jesus had been killed. 
His close associates had closeted themselves behind locked doors for fear. It might not have been safe for them to go and talk about the resurrection. Maybe it was a little safer because they were women, but when Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the church, he made no distinction. But here too, Jesus never said it would be otherwise. He never said it would be safe. Indeed, he said, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. He sent them out, and he continues to send people out, some to very scary places. Important fact, but I think in theory we understand, where Jesus says, Acts 1, 8, you will be my witnesses. It wasn't you, the 12, or you, the early church. It was you in the blue, you in the third row, you who have Jesus in your heart, you are my witnesses. In fact, we stand squarely with the women of our text. We have good news that everybody needs, but not everybody wants. And we may have fear. I do, for one. And we have Jesus telling us what the angel told the woman. Go tell. One other thing, it's a point that maybe doesn't get adequate attention. Like the disciples that first heard Jesus' great commission, we're a body, we're an organism. The Holy Spirit has made us into a team. In witness, as in a lot of things, we're not intended to be an assemblage of lone rangers, everybody for himself. We're here to help one another to encourage one another and complement one another. As someone has said it, if you're not going to fish, cut bait, but one way or another get with the program. Illustration of such teamwork, I know a man, he's a family friend, well described as an evangelist. Now, he didn't talk to crowds, he talked to individuals but he did so, and that effectively, a lot of them. He'd bring cases that were on his heart to my mom <laughs> to put on her prayer list. I heard him tell her, I'm a mouth, I can talk. I'm not an eye, I can't cry. Please pray for that guy. I'm going to talk to him, pray for him, and for me. My mom, to understand the case, was not a mouth. Except in talking to God. She and our evangelist friend were a team for the gospel. We can be a team for the gospel. Question. What do you do with the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for men and women, boys and girls, sinful men and women, and rose from the dead? First, believe it. Identify with those sinful people and believe in Christ and his sacrifice. Do that, and you will be saved from eternal death. Then, well, what do you do if you found a really good restaurant at the men's breakfast that we're going to have next week? You know, as we said, you know, I found a restaurant in Owatonna. Man, it was great. The fish, ah! If you believe it, you want to tell it. Or a good soup recipe. Share the good news. Let's pray that the Spirit will work in us what it takes to conquer fear that silences us, and they work in us a spirit of teamwork to work together, to encourage one another, 
to spread the good news. Something that I love about Easter hymns, many of them, they speak about the resurrection and then they go on to tell of what all of that means to us right now, what our living Savior is doing in and through us and in our world. So let's stand and let's sing, I know that my Redeemer lives. died and rose again to save us from eternal death. Quoted earlier Paul's words, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Practically, you can say that puts a ball in our court. Or to say it otherwise, that's a knocking at our door. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. That invitation is for you and for all the world that Jesus died to save. Let's pray. Lord, you have a word for each and every one of us today to believe your good news, to heed your call, to share what you so graciously give us. Oh Lord, we thank you for the great goodness that we share today. In Jesus' name, amen. Our benediction is from Hebrews 13. God has raised from death our Lord Jesus, who is the great shepherd of the sheep as a result of his blood, by which the eternal covenant is sealed. May the God of peace provide you with every good thing you need in order to do his will. And may he, 
through Jesus Christ, do in us what pleases him. And to Christ be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing that as our doxology. Thank you. 